Hello everyone, welcome to the final uh, Zoom Q&A of the day. Um, joining me is Katie Childs, our Chief Executive, and hopefully you've all just enjoyed her really informative um, video about the uh, women who wrote plants. And it's um, another aspect of our library collection that um, I've not really explored much and it's really amazing to see all those stories. Um, so um, as with the other Zoom um, Q&As, we'll have a bit of a protocol whereby everyone is muted. Um, but if you have a question to submit, you can do it on the chat function. So that should be somewhere on the bottom of your screen, depending on your device. You click on chat and then just type in your question there and I'll field that to Katie. Or if you'd like to uh, sort of say your question out loud and hear your voice and see your face, um, you can use the raise hand uh, button and that's on your participants section. And you just say raise hand and we'll come to you and unmute you then. Um, so without further ado, here's Katie. Um, Katie, I'll start off with a question um, just while maybe people are sort of mulling things over and thinking of things to ask you. Um, I know when you were researching this, um, because this was for a, an exhibition that we're going to have still at some point in the library when we reopen, um, and you were saying basically the more the more you research the more you found um, so I know there were quite a few stories I think that you sort of had to leave out and, and be ruthless with um, so maybe you could tell us a bit about about maybe one of those yeah no I mean, there, there are um, there are a few of the of the works in the collections that I looked at um, but that um, obviously I couldn't fit into into that talk, um, and we may um, or may not fit fit more people into the exhibition when we um, when we finally do it in the library. Um, but there was one lady who who I did try and include in the talk, um, but her story is so long and fascinating that talk could have gone on and on and on. Um, but she's Maria Elizabeth Jackson, and that's Jackson without a K. Um, and she's a, a contemporary with Jane Austen. So around about, um, born around about the same time. Um, and she published um, a book called Botanical Dialogues, which when I showed um, those clips of the, of the light of the library shelves, um, Botanical Dialogues is, is uh, in a lot of those, um, in a lot of those pictures. Um, and it is set up as a um, similarly, this creative nonfiction, this way of explaining the natural world to children and particularly Linnaean um, system of botany to children. Um, and so she sets it up as a, as a story between Hortensia and her four children. And, and they have this um, way of, uh, of kind of discussing, which goes into, into quite a lot of detail, but particularly about the Linnaean system of botany. Um, she's interesting though, more because of, of why she wrote. Um, so I, I mentioned um, there were two Quaker writers, Priscilla Wakefield and Sarah Lucy Atkins. Um, but she was um, much more um, motive. She had to write. She had to write um, for a, a kind of financial reasons um, because she she didn't marry and neither did her sister Frances. And Frances Jackson is also very well represented in the Chawton House collection. Um, and they uh, were both literary daughters of a vicar, which is very familiar to those who know. Um, who know Jane Austen, and after their father died in 1808, they were um, utterly dependent on male relatives. Um, and they, unlike Jane, couldn't depend on, their, um, on her brother, because um, Shawcross was particularly uh, into drinking and gambling. And actually both sisters um, used the receipts of their books to pay off Shawcross's gambling debts. Um, and it was actually uh, cousins who, in the end, found them uh, property to, in which they lived in for the rest of their life um, and her cousin Sir Brooke Boothby who introduced her into sort of scientific society in Litchfield um, which is why she has this, um, this kind of really scientific basis for, for botanical dialogues um, but she also criticises quite a lot of um, some of the social inferences in Linnaean uh, categorisation about there are specific roles for men and women um, and you can probably understand that. So she sets it out as these are the social norms, but there's, there's this implicit criticism. And you can probably understand that if you are writing to pay off your errant brother's gambling debts. Um, so she's, um, she's a really interesting character. I'd, um, I don't know if anybody does know more about her. I'd really like to, to find out more about the family. That's such a, a familiar tale, isn't it? I think the more of the women's stories that we look at um, from our collection, 
there are so many that that write for uh, clearing their male counterparts' debts. <laughs> just... yeah, well, Amanda spoke so well about um, uh, um, Blackwell. Blackwell clearing off Alexander's debts. Um, I mean, uh, Shawcross, Alexander Blackwell. Um, there, there, yes, uh, there's a series of, of the, you write the male acquaintances of the women in our collection who who are the reason they wrote. Yeah, which is what makes them so amazing, partly. Um, so, um, just while we're waiting for any other questions to come through, um, do you think you could maybe talk a bit about botany as being sort of the acceptable science for women to pursue in that era? And maybe that's why it was sort of proliferating. Yeah, well, I'd, um, I think it was wasn't necessarily um, the kind of the scientific endeavour, um, and as Amanda said, quite a number of those women used kind of subterfuge um, as a way of being able to to pursue their interest in kind of plant collecting and and scientific discovery, um, and it it seems um, again from the works that we've got in our collection that they that women created this this kind of literary form for themselves, which was. Um, taking but and having to understand really complex areas of botany and being able to indulge and, um, and explore their own interests in the natural world but the acceptable ways of doing that are writing for children so writing is in, is in structuresses which is how Priscilla Wakefield referred to herself um, or, or as illustrators um, and it's really when you get later through the 19th century so you get to somebody like Anne Pratt and that beautiful five volumes that we've got um, in, our, in our library where she is a scientist and an illustrator and she brings in some of the, the kind of literary references. Um, Victorian botanical writing by women becomes quite, um, uh, it, it's, it's like writing stories um, and it's like writing kind of history and, and myth, uh, kind of mythology. Uh, it becomes um, less scientific and more artistic and it's only really at the turn of the century where you start to pull those back together really interesting just the way it sort of changes and, and moves through the century and um, I'm still waiting on a question although um, Brenda has put on the chat um, and she's asking if we could maybe write out the names of some of the writers because um, she yeah. found it quite hard oh. to catch them um, but of course there will be an exhibition as well but we could probably put um, some information online um, yes, I know absolutely. when um, you and I were first talking about the exhibition um, one name that you were quite keen to explore was Beatrix Potter. Um, yes. Were you looking into some of her writing? Yeah, well, I was, what I was really interested in with Beatrix Potter um, is the fact that she, of course, of course she's well known for Peter Rabbit and, um, and you can reread those um, children's stories and the way in which um, that uh, the way in which she describes the, the Lake District in the natural world. Um, and you understand that if you visit her home at Hilltop, which um, sort of explains why, why literary houses are so, um, are so important. Um, but actually, there's a whole separate life and story of Beatrix Potter, that she was this quite pioneering expert in fungi. Um, and she was enormously talented, obviously illustrator for the books, but um, particularly talented illustrator um, of fungus. And she, in, in having this really detailed study, she made all sorts of discoveries um, that were un, that previously unknown um, and really struggled to, um, to be taken seriously um, within the sort of male scientific circles in London, even though she had made, um, she had made discoveries. She wrote papers um, for the Linnaean Society, um, which she really struggled to get, um, to get published. Um, but her, her botanical drawings are extraordinary and they're in the Armit Library collection. I went to see them um, about six months ago and it was, um, and they are really very beautiful. Um, unfortunately, because I wanted, we don't have anything of her at Chawton House, um, but I would, it would be lovely if we could um, maybe borrow something from the Armit to show how um, you have these really talented illustrators and who are using their, their really detailed knowledge um, and then uh, and then it's as late as, as Beatrix possibly into the 20th century, kind of filtering that through children's fiction um, as a way of infusing children in the natural world. It's really interesting because, yeah, I, I didn't really know that about her, um, that she was sort of into that, the, the drawings as well as her, her children's. Um, but there is obviously so much tie back into those two 
areas. Um, so apart from those drawings, um, is there anything else that you came across that you would have loved to have borrowed um, for this exhibition? Oh, oh well, maybe, maybe we still could. Um, <laughs> So there is, uh, I'd love to, to borrow something um, that represents Gertrude Jekyll. Um, and uh, well, you know that I would love to find some sort of fingerprint of Gertrude Jekyll in the gardens at, at Chorton. Um, but finding that the first edition of Home and Garden was um, in, the, in the upper reading room was really, was really lovely. Um, but again, she, her relationship and friendship with um, female artists at the time who, and, and kind of people who, were very good at, at creating um, representations of nature. Um, there's a really tiny um, little doll's house vase in the collection at the Garden Museum, um, which was created for the doll's house that Sir Edwin Lutyens designed. And Gertrude Jekyll designed the garden to go with this doll's house. And her friend designed this exquisite tiny little um, uh, vase, tulip vase. Um, that would go in the doll's house. Um, and I, I, I like that idea of, of Gertrude is quite a, 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 she's certainly not a glamorous garden designer, even though that her creations are absolutely beautiful. She's, um, but the idea that she's associated with creating this really beautiful, delicate art, um, I absolutely loved. Um, and again, it brings it back to, to children and, and infusing children in the natural world. Mm. And how amazing! I don't think I've ever seen a doll's house garden before. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. plant it. <laughs> There's another layer to that relationship that Rebecca Lilly was talking about this afternoon between Gertrude and and Sir Edwin Lutyens, um, which is an unlikely friendship um, on paper, um, but it shows the sorts of the, the kind of creative different ways in which they um, they brought together. Uh, kind of the home and architecture, landscape gardening, and and the, the plants that were were involved in it. I think the big surprise in in looking in, uh, at the uh, at the works we've got in our collection and, and women's role in botany and plants was their complete absence in plant design until the very early twentieth late nineteenth century, but really early twentieth century. Um, and then that period, the first sort of twenty five years. Um, of the 20th century was there was a real almost explosion in women's um, horticultural design um, and it's um, but it, it did take someone like Gertrude I think um, and her contemporaries to be that pioneer. Mm, yeah that's interesting because we often obviously talk about the history of the gardens here um, and we talk a lot about the landscape movement of the 18th century but it is quite male dominated I think I don't think there were kind of women involved or not that we know yeah, about. women were working in their gardens so um we know our rose garden um you're sat in the lower library terrace um but our rose garden which is further up the up the garden that florence knight um had such a strong hand in in kind of creating that and tending the rose garden and um, so she was like again late 19th century um early 20th century flowers but florence's particular area um, May Knight, who was Edward Austin Knight's um, middle daughter, um, she uh, remained unmarried for her whole life. She lived until she was 80 something. She's a, a, an extraordinary woman. Um, and when uh, her brother Edward sold God Machine and she moved um, in with her brother Charles into the rectory, um, which if you turn round, <laughs> you'll probably be able to see at the end of the drive at Chawson. She um, really dedicated quite a lot of her life to creating the garden at the front of the rectory and created her own garden book. So women were involved in gardening and were creating their own domestic gardens, but not in terms of the kind of big commercial country house gardens that, that Gertrude Jekyll went on to do and then Nora Lindsay after her. Yeah. Okay, I've got a question from Cleo, actually, our colleague. <laughs> so I'm going to unmute her and hopefully show her video as well. Ah, here we go. <laughs> Hello, hi. Um, Hello. So the great thing about this as an exhibition display is how visual it is. Obviously, the stories behind the women writers is extraordinary, but actually what you see on display is the draw, really. Um, so I was going to ask, do you have a favourite of the works that are visually your favourite? So irrespective of getting an errant relation out of um, Betty's prison, just looking at the page, do you sort of have a favourite book plate or image or design? 
Um, you see, if I'd have answered, if you'd have asked me that last week, um, I would probably have said Anne Pratt because just because, even though they're not, they're, they're printed um, from her originals, um, there's just so many of them and they're, they're, the, the detail's extraordinary. But when I was uh, in Chorton in the, in the stores last week, looking, kind of take, taking some of the images, looking for what I was going to include, I hadn't really looked in detail at that sketchbook um, or the book of, of how, to, how to draw plants by Miss Smith, um, the mysterious Miss Smith from Doncaster. Um, and I think that is absolutely exquisite um, because it's, it's so beautifully put together. Um, and the detail um, that she um, that she goes into um, in how to draw uh, each particular flower that she covers, um, but the the sketch drawing and then the painted drawing for you to cover that it's just as a piece of art is absolutely beautiful. Um, and uh, yeah, that that's one that I wasn't sure it would have been on my object list beforehand, but it, it's absolutely going to be. I'm um, going to be in there now, providing it fits in the case. It's quite big, so it would, yeah, it's probably about 30, 40 centimetres. So it's, that's, the, with, with that and Mary Lawrence's book, they are, and Elizabeth Blackwell, is they are big pieces of work. So, yeah, there's, there's a bit of an engineering question about which, which case we can fit them in and how they, how they fit in. But as a, just as an aesthetic piece of work, that is absolutely glorious. And if anyone knows who Miss Smith from Doncaster was, then I'd absolutely love to know. Brilliant, thank you. Well, I think the questions seem to have um, slowed down, so I might just bring that to um, a hold. Is there anything else that you would add, Katie, for living your talk? Well, because you've given a bit of a sneak peek of an exhibition that we've not put on, um, then obviously if there's, there's particular stories in that presentation people have enjoyed and want us to, to find out a little bit more about, do tell us. Um, or if there's something that they think we might be interested in, um, then yeah, do tell us because it's it's unlike um, Cleo's wonderful Man Up exhibition, um, which is is in, is there and installed. This one's still a work in progress. So um, so yeah, any ideas and suggestions would be really welcome. Yeah, it'd be really nice get some uh, collaborative input. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much um, for your talk and for joining the Q&A. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, so we've come to the end of day one. Um, day two tomorrow, we've got lots more to look forward to. So you'll receive an email uh, then with uh, Zoom, Zoom info and, and the programme. And we hope you join us again and enjoy your lovely sunny evening. Bye. Goodbye. Yeah,